Hi! Welcome to the first segment of this two-part episode putting a little bit of context behind one of my very favorite things in all music, Louis Armstrong's song Tight Like This, recorded in Chicago in December 1928. In this first part, we'll focus on some of the early developments of Armstrong as an artist, and of jazz in general. Then in part two, we'll take a closer look at just what Armstrong was up to in Chicago in the late 20s, when he was absolutely at his artistic peak. And then we'll spend some time looking at this song in some detail. You might notice my hair will be shorter. It's been a couple of months since I shot this, and we're in the middle of a pandemic, so what are you going to do? We got a lot to cover, so let's get right to it. I'm Peter, and this is We Need to Talk About Music. Today, I'm really excited to talk about what may be my very favorite song of all time, Tight Like This by Louis Armstrong and his Savoy Ballroom 5. Armstrong is probably somebody you've at least heard of before, although you may have a picture of him in your mind more like this. For four solid decades, he was one of the biggest stars in music, period. He may still be unmatched in the U.S. in terms of his sustained popularity across racial lines. He was even able to take the number one spot on the pop charts away from the Beatles during the peak of Beatlemania. Tight Like This is a document of the moment just before all that stuff got started. It was recorded on December 12, 1928, at the very last recording session of Armstrong's Chicago period, when he was already regarded as a living legend among those in the know, but stood on the verge of attaining a status that no African-American musician before him had attained, both for better and for worse. In the six years since he first arrived in Chicago, he had undergone a profound evolution, both to his musical style and his artistic persona, and Tight Like This serves as a perfect demonstration of the astoundingly confident and charismatic performer who had emerged from this process. But before we start talking about the song, let's take a quick look at what had to happen first in order for it to be possible in the first place. When it comes to Tight Like This, and to Armstrong's whole career for that matter, and the careers of a lot of other people, the most important big context is the special situation of the city of New Orleans, Louisiana, Armstrong's hometown. New Orleans is, of course, a U.S. city, but there always seems to have been something about it that just makes it stick out as a little bit different from other U.S. cities. Part of the reason for this, famously, comes down to colonial history. New Orleans was set up by the French, who used it to control access to the Mississippi River during the 18th century. This colonial relationship didn't really last very long, though. The French lost Louisiana to Spain in the 1760s, and they only got it back for a couple of years before selling it off to the U.S. in 1803. For whatever reason, though, this French connection has never stopped looming very large in the city's identity. The other part is geographical. New Orleans sits at the top of a swampy mess of land that sticks out into the Gulf of Mexico at the base of the Mississippi River. And this makes it relatively difficult to get there from the rest of the U.S., or at least it did for a large part of its history. It's actually easier to get to New Orleans over water than it is over land, and this has given the city an unusually strong connection to places that can be reached over water, like Europe, the Caribbean, and most importantly, Western Africa. One thing that New Orleans does have in common with the rest of the southern United States is a shameful history of slavery. But even in this aspect, there's something just a little bit different. As the site of the United States' largest slave market, New Orleans was the most common point of arrival for newly abducted and enslaved people, all of whom brought with them a first-hand cultural knowledge that was growing increasingly rare among enslaved people further inland. Maybe in tacit acknowledgement of this situation, or maybe under the influence of the Caribbean, where the institution of slavery was organized in a different, but no less brutal way. The forced cultural indoctrination of enslaved people seems to have been slightly de-emphasized in New Orleans compared to the rest of the U.S. 
The city also had an unusually high pre-Civil War free black population, largely originating with immigrants from the Caribbean. After the abolition of slavery, another large group of immigrants, mostly from the enormous plantations of Louisiana and Mississippi, were added to the mix, a group that included the ancestors of Armstrong and many of his compatriots. This combination of influences very likely gave the black people of New Orleans a bit of a leg up over the rest of African America. At any rate, by the late 19th century, the city was on fire with music. Dozens of bands could be heard every day marching through the streets in parades, which are still a pretty big deal there, or performing in the kind of entertainment venues that you find in any big port city. These bands played all kinds of music, but one thing that was typical of a lot of them was a technique called ragging, which is a way of breaking up the rhythm of a melody to make it more syncopated and exciting. Mary had a little lamb, just as one silly example. Gradually, musicians developed this into a method of polyphonic collective semi-improvisation, in which one group of rhythm instruments would provide a fixed, predictable foundation, while another group of melodic instruments added a more variable layer, but still based on more or less fixed relationships to the original tune. This is basically the beginning of what we would call jazz, but nobody would have called it that for quite some time. And a lot of musicians always remained kind of suspicious of the term, preferring to call what they did ragtime or simply hot music. Louis Armstrong probably never knew a world that didn't have this kind of music in it. Growing up just outside of Storyville, the city's legalized red light district, and working as a child delivering coal to the businesses there, he would have had an unusual opportunity to witness some of its early developments firsthand. Armstrong had a pretty tough childhood, as did pretty much any poor African-American child growing up during one of the most intense and violent periods of racism in American history. He also had some lucky breaks. After picking up the cornet during a stint in reform school for firing a pistol into the air, he was soon noticed by one of the city's top players, Joseph Nathan Oliver, later known as King Oliver, who took him under his wing. He also showed something of his extraordinary character by taking responsibility for Clarence, the mentally disabled son of a cousin who passed away when he was still a young teenager. Just when Armstrong was reaching the age when he could really start to make his mark on the New Orleans scene, the scene kind of started to leave New Orleans. There were several reasons for this. The one that's usually gotten the most attention is the closure of Storyville by the New Orleans government in 1917. It's true that this probably did lead to a reduced number of jobs available for working musicians, but its impact has probably been overstated just a bit. The scene didn't begin and end with the red light district. And anyway, there was a lot more going on in 1917. Another significant factor was probably the First World War. Any big war takes a lot of young people out of their hometowns for the very first time, and not all of them want to go home again when it's all over. For African Americans in particular, the relatively chilled out racial dynamics of England and France were such a revelation that many couldn't imagine returning afterwards, especially to the militantly racist South. There was also, for very similar reasons, just a general trend among Southern African Americans of moving to Northern and Western cities, which were experiencing an industrial boom at the time. That a lot of musicians also went north was, to a certain extent, just an extension of this general trend. A final important factor was the arrival of the very first records by a group called the Original Dixieland Jazz Band. ODJB, as they're often called, was a group of white guys, and they were not the most subtle of early jazz practitioners by a long shot. But they were actually from New Orleans, and they were about as aware of what had been going on there musically as was possible in such a rigidly segregated community. In particular, the group's clarinetist, Larry Shields, has often been cited as an influence by jazz musicians, including Armstrong. At any rate, they were a hit, and although many musicians weren't thrilled about the fact that they, and not one of the early African-American groups to head north, had been the first to reap the rewards, their success meant that there was now a national, even international, market for a new style of music that still very few people knew how to play. 
this was an opportunity that was hard to pass up. And soon, Armstrong's mentor, Oliver, left for Chicago, leaving Armstrong to take his place in trombonist Kid Ori's band. Then Ori left too, and Armstrong spent some time playing on riverboats, where he learned how to read music. Until finally, in 1922, he was summoned to Chicago to play second cornet to Oliver, who was now leading one of the city's hottest bands. As the biggest city in the Midwest, Chicago was the unquestioned epicenter of migration for African Americans from anywhere along the Mississippi River corridor. Its south side had already become an incredibly exciting place to be long before Armstrong got there. At the center of it all was the Stroll, a stretch of State Street that was, at the time, a 24-hour entertainment district, full of swanky nightclubs, barbershops, and movie theaters. The 21-year-old Armstrong had never seen anything remotely like it. He spent the next two years getting to know this world while he worked as a faithful apprentice for Oliver. During this time, he was featured on records for the first time. The 35 songs he recorded with King Oliver's band, all of which were made with extremely limited acoustic technology and stiflingly hot little rooms, can be kind of hard to listen to. The band rarely sounds particularly comfortable or relaxed, and Armstrong, who's been shunted into the corner to keep him from being louder than Oliver, is often nearly inaudible. There are some interesting moments, though, like his first recorded solo on Chimes Blues, or Tears, a song that features him on a series of solo breaks, places where the rest of the band cuts out for a moment, and you can actually hear his trademark mature style coming through for the first time. Even more importantly, it was during this time that Armstrong met and ultimately married the group's pianist, Lillian or Lil Hardin. Hardin, who had come from a relatively financially stable Memphis family, had been classically trained at the piano and had even done a college prep course at Fisk University, came from a pretty different world from Armstrong's. When she arrived in Chicago, she got a job as a song demonstrator in a music shop and soon transitioned to playing in some of the city's first jazz bands, despite having no prior experience with the style at all. By the time Armstrong arrived, she had become a fixture of the scene, becoming one of the first non-New Orleansians and one of the first women to do so. Hardin's skill as a musician has been underrecognized in part because of her unshowy style and in part because of, you know, sexism. She did have some opportunities to show off her chops here and there, like in the faux classical introduction to the Hot Five song You're Next. But to me, the best example of her unique abilities is found in kind of an odd place. Blue Yodel No. 9, a song that she and Armstrong recorded with the foundational country singer Jimmy Rogers in the early 30s. The song, like many other songs Armstrong recorded, is a 12-bar blues, but Rogers, in the manner of a country blues guitarist, is constantly varying up the pattern, adding or subtracting a bar here and there, seemingly on a whim. Armstrong seems to be completely mystified by this, and the two proceed to step on each other's toes so much that it could almost be a comedy record. But Hardin is completely unfazed, she follows Roger's lead throughout the song, without ever missing a beat, as if nothing odd is happening at all. At this time, though, at least as she later told it, while she was really interested in jazz for all the money she could make from it, she was pretty much totally indifferent to it musically. Now, Hardin had been raised with some pretty serious prejudices against popular music of all kinds, and that probably played into this. But at the same time, just to be fair, the job of an early jazz piano player, which pretty much consisted of just playing single block chords for every beat, does sound like it could be pretty boring and restrictive. There's even a story of one time when Hardin decided to insert a little scale run, and she was scolded by Oliver for this, who told her, we already have a clarinet in this band. So hey. Anyway, when Hardin first met Armstrong, she was already super fashionable and sophisticated, and she was pretty unimpressed with him. She even used the word disgusted. The story goes that it wasn't until a little bit later when Oliver let it slip that Armstrong was actually a stronger player than him that she really started to take notice of him. This anecdote 
whether actually true or not, symbolizes a class-related tension that ultimately would drive them farther and farther apart until they finally divorced in 1938. As Armstrong expert Thomas Brothers put it, he disdained people who put on airs, and she had been taught to do just that. Maybe their relationship was ultimately doomed to fail, but at the same time, once she finally noticed Armstrong, she seems to have seen a potential in him that maybe even he couldn't see in himself yet, and she definitely did a whole lot to help him achieve it. She taught him about the world of music that she knew and he didn't, while well, he presumably did the same for her, and she encouraged him to take music lessons to learn the things that she couldn't teach him. At this time, there was a big trend for what was called freak music, which was using mutes and hats and bananas and all kinds of things to make weird sounds come out of trumpets and cornets. This style was later made famous by the trumpeters in Duke Ellington's band, and by the unseen adult characters in Peanuts cartoons. This was Oliver's specialty, but Armstrong just wasn't any good at it. Ultimately, he was able to more than compensate for this by developing a style that combined unprecedented rhythmic and harmonic subtlety with intoxicatingly powerful and controlled tone. But the fact that he was able to do that in the first place was largely the result of this extra education that he received due to Lillian's influence. She was also way more ambitious than him, and she encouraged him to think bigger than just playing second cornet for Oliver a job he very likely would have kept a lot longer just out of sheer loyalty left to his own devices. He was reluctant to leave his mentor behind, but finally, after two years, she convinced him it was time. Shortly thereafter, he accepted an invitation to move to New York to join the Fletcher Henderson Orchestra. Today, Henderson has become a big name in jazz history, so it's important to note that, at least in 1924, he was absolutely not a jazz musician. And this was not a jazz band. Henderson was a classically trained pianist and college-educated chemist, and his band was fully in the tradition of the mainstream dance orchestra, something that hardly exists at all today, but was very much at the heart of popular music in the 1920s. These bands emphasized versatility, and they could play anything from polkas to sentimental Broadway ballads to Sousa marches, depending on what people wanted to listen to. But whatever they played, they played it with an air of smooth, sleek sophistication. In 1924, audiences were demanding jazz, by which they basically just meant music with a lot of energy and some syncopated rhythms in it. Hiring a hot soloist like Armstrong was one easy way to meet that demand, but was popular with both black and white groups at the time. Now, Gradually, with help from an arranger named Don Redman, Henderson was able to inject more of the spirit and energy of jazz into his music, ultimately creating the signature style of the swing era ten years later. But at the time when Armstrong was in the group, this process had hardly begun. This was a completely new world for Armstrong. He had some experience playing from arrangements on riverboats, and by this point he was a pretty good reader, but he found the atmosphere of playing in such a self-consciously elite group stifling, and it's pretty clear from later comments that he considered Henderson to be a snob. Also, the Roseland Ballroom, where the Henderson Orchestra performed every night, was a whites-only venue. Now, in addition to just being objectively offensive, this must have been incredibly strange for the young Armstrong, who had only ever played for predominantly black audiences before this point. On arriving in Chicago, after being used to the culturally and legally enforced segregation of New Orleans, Armstrong had been shocked by the little clusters of young white musicians that hovered around Oliver's bandstand. Groups of these guys, who were nicknamed Alligators, would come out every night after finishing their own gigs in the white part of town to learn from, or steal, depending on your point of view, techniques from groups like Oliver's. Many of them went on to use what they learned to achieve far greater financial success than most of the people they were imitating. Situations like this, in which genuine love and admiration occur within a racist context that make actual fair exchanges of ideas pretty much impossible, are a complicated issue. One that keeps popping up again and again in the history of popular music. Armstrong, who said that he had enough ideas that he didn't have to worry about a few being stolen here and there, 
was less ambivalent than many of his peers about the presence of these alligators. At the Roseland, though, where the only African-American faces to be seen in the crowd belong to employees, there was a pretty different power dynamic, and an audience whose appreciation may have had more to do with exoticism and perverse fascination than with any sincere love or admiration. For better or worse, this was a dynamic that would become more and more familiar to Armstrong as his career progressed. Nonetheless, being a featured soloist gave Armstrong the opportunity to flex his creative and technical muscles in a way that he'd never been able to before. He gradually settled in and became more comfortable with the whole situation, but it still may have come as a bit of a relief when, after about a year, he was contacted by Hardin, who told him that she didn't think Henderson was giving him the billing he deserved, and she wanted him to come back to Chicago and join the new band she was forming at the Dreamland a nightclub that catered to both black and white customers, where she would be billing him as the world's greatest cornet player. All right, that's where I'll end part one. When we return, we'll have a look at Armstrong's second stint in Chicago, the time when he created his legendary Hot Five and Hot Seven records. And of course, we'll spend some time looking at tight like this. It should definitely be a good time, so be sure to tune in. For the meantime, stay healthy and happy, and don't forget to listen to some music now and then. <laughs>